Great song. Take your Bible this morning, turn to Proverbs chapter number 8. Proverbs chapter 8, we're dealing with part 4 this morning on timely truth for tranquility. Timely truths for tranquility. We've been talking about how to have peace in your life. We left off last week talking about the fact that, that if you live your life seeking God's approval, seeking to please the Lord in your life, if you'll live your life that way, God's going to give you peace in your life because you're going to make choices and decisions that will please Him and not grieve Him in your life. So we're going to be beginning this morning looking at a list of what is approved or what is acceptable to God. If we're going to please Him, all right, what does He like? What does He approve? So let's pray. Father, thank you again for the morning. We pray that you'll bless our time in the Word this morning. Help us, Lord, to glean these wonderful truths this morning on how to please you, how to do those things that are acceptable, what is acceptable. Lord, help us to understand that today. And Lord, we pray that if there's one here that does not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, Lord, I pray that that person today would invite you into their heart and trust you for salvation. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Look at Proverbs chapter 8. Look at verse 35. For whoso findeth me findeth life, and shall obtain favor of the Lord. All right, what does God approve or accept? Wisdom is acceptable. Wisdom is approved. The context of Proverbs chapter 8 is about wisdom. That's what Proverbs 8.35 is talking about. This is the me in that verse. Solomon says that if you will find wisdom, you'll find life and obtain the Lord's favor. That ought to get our attention. That word favor is from the word ratzon, and it means pleasure, his delight, his acceptance or his favor. God is pleased when we find and apply wisdom in our decisions. Understand that wisdom begins by trusting the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. That's where it begins. That's where it starts. King Solomon said, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In Proverbs 9.10, Trusting Jesus as your Savior is the smartest thing that you can do because that decision is going to affect you for the rest of eternity. Listen, you want to spend eternity with the Lord. You don't want to spend eternity in hell. And if you reject the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Bible says that's where, you're, where you will spend eternity. Solomon says we will find life. Life is found in Jesus Christ now and for eternity. Uh, the word life is interesting. It's from the word kae, uh, which not only means life, but it also means sustenance, revival, renewal. That makes a whole lot of sense. Seeking God's wisdom leads to revival, and it leads to blessing in your personal life. I don't know about you, but I want to enjoy the blessings of God in my life. I want that. How many of you would want that? Say amen. You know, God's wisdom clarifies His will and purpose for our lives. Uh, that purpose, if you're a Christian, God's purpose for your life is to bring honor and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ by the way you live your life. Like a thief that mugs a person on the street or a burglar that breaks into your home and sifts through your cabinets, closets, and furniture, taking your valuables, the wisdom of this world robs you of life and it robs you of common sense. For the world's wisdom is foolish, says the Lord. Uh, it caters to your flesh and your selfishness. 
Such foolishness ignores God. It ignores His commands and His promises for blessing, love, peace, and joy. In fact, here's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3.19. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. The wisdom of this world distorts the true purpose of your life as a Christian. It leaves a person devoid of any purpose at all. Uh, People with worldly wisdom, uh, many times they don't even know why they exist. Uh, They don't know why they are here on planet earth. Or they don't know what they are supposed to do with their lives. That is why the Lord labels worldly wisdom as foolish. Now there's something else that the Lord likes. Weights that are accurate and are acceptable. Proverbs 11, if you want to go there, verse number 1. Proverbs 11, 1. Now here's what Solomon wrote here. He says this. A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is His delight. A just weight is accurate and honest. Uh, When they traded their goods in the market, they would have scales that would tip like that. And they would use weights on one end, and they would put the product on the other end. And uh, God says when a weight was just, when it was fair, when it was accurate, that pleased the Lord. If it was a crooked weight, that was an abomination to him. Uh, You know what? In your business matters or personal affairs with people, matters like truthfulness, honesty, and integrity are essential if you're going to be doing business with other people. Uh, That's why it's important that we don't cheat people when we're selling stuff to them. And that's why we need to pay our bill when we buy, buy stuff from them. This kind of behavior delights or is acceptable to God. Now, there's a third thing that the Lord likes. It's found in Proverbs 11, verse number 20. The way, the way of integrity and uprightness is acceptable to the Lord. Look what this verse says. They that are of a forward heart are an abomination to the Lord. But such as are upright in their way are His delight. That phrase, forward heart, in the Hebrew means distorted from the right. It means obstinate or stubborn in error. Those who behave this way are an abomination to the Lord. Good night. I don't want to live my life in such a way where I just really tick off the Lord where I'm an abomination to him. And he's put in scripture verses that tell us what is an abomination to him. And this is one of them. Uh, People that are determined to be depraved, to be disobedient and deceitful are an abomination to the Lord. The upright, however, are approved. They are accepted, the Bible says. And this is the idea behind that word, delight. God's blessings, God's favor are upon those who have integrity and they do what is right. Proverbs 15, 9 says this, The way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord, but he loveth him that followeth after righteousness. Have you ever seen a dog chase a rabbit? How many of you have seen that? Would you raise your hand? Okay. You know, sometimes rabbits get into our backyard. You guys have a problem with that? We do. When I let our dog out the back door each night, she has to go to the restroom. When I let her out, if she smells a rabbit, she smells it immediately from the upper deck of our house and she takes off like a rocket toward that smell. Even if she has arthritis, 
even if she is hobbling around the house and has, and has pain, she will go into a sprint to find that rabbit and get that rabbit. She runs and she pursues Bugs Bunny. And I feel sorry for Bugs. Amen. But that's what she does. That is the idea of this word followeth in this verse. It's from the word radaf, which not only means to follow after something, but to run after, to pursue, or to chase. And the verb here indicates it's a persistent, a continual pursuit. There is no quitting, there is no giving up. <coughs> Solomon states that the Lord loves the person that follows or chases after righteousness. He approves what they are doing. Chasing something indicates eagerness, earnestness, enthusiasm, and effort. This is to be our attitude when it comes to righteousness in our life. When you chase after something, you keep your eye on it so you will know where to run. It is difficult to chase after something that you cannot see. Our eyes are to be focused on doing what is right as we pursue it. And our eyes are to be focused and upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, you keep your eyes on Him, your focus on Him is going to help you do what is right each day. Now there's something else that is approved by the Lord is found in Proverbs chapter 3 verse 34. Being without pride <coughs> or having humility in your life is acceptable and it's approved by God. Proverbs 3.34 Surely he scorneth the scorners, but he giveth grace unto the lowly. Peter said in 1 Peter 3.4 But let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not a corruptible, even, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which in the sight of God is of great price. A meek and a quiet spirit is of great value to the Lord. God gives grace to the lowly or humble. In fact, that word grace is from the word kin, and it means grace, it means favor or acceptance. Pride and humility are addressed in that verse. The scorn of the scorner has its root in pride. Pride, oh boy, pride causes a person to overvalue himself and undervalue the Lord and what He has done for every one of us. It causes a person to become independent of the Lord and to take credit for what God has done in his or her life. Jesus made it clear that, with, that we are nothing without Him in John 15, 5. Genuine humility is favored or approved by the Lord because it reflects an attitude of gratitude toward God and toward other people who have invested in your life all throughout your life. If you have accomplished great things, realize a whole lot of people have helped you to get where you are. And the Lord has blessed you. In fact, He has blessed you every day. He's blessed you already today because you're here. You're here. You say, well, I don't know if God's blessed me. That's because you have not learned to count His blessings in your life. He has blessed you. You know, humility helps us to avoid the twilight zone where you think that you are God's gift to the world. It keeps our head from swelling, but not our heart. 
as it swells in love, adoration, and reverence for the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you know what you have done and you know where you are because of Him and Him alone. The humble person realizes and acknowledges his limitations, but also understands that he can do all things through, through Christ who strengthens him. God's favor and approval are upon those with humility because they have a teachable spirit and they're willing to follow God's word, his direction, and his will for their lives. When a person has a spirit of humility, he has learned to be content with God's provisions, patient when he has problems, and enjoy peace when fear shadows his life. The grace of God enables us to have a humble mind which in turn helps us to bring honor and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, James said this in James 4, 6, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. James said in James 4, 10, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. You know, as a young Irish woman working in England in the late 1800s, Amy Carmichael decided to answer God's call to serve in the mission field. Twice rejected for medical reasons, she eventually found a mission agency willing to put her on a ship and send her to the country of India. She arrived with tropical fever and a temperature of 105. That's what she had when she got off the boat. Some missionaries who met her believe that she wouldn't last six months in India. But Amy recovered, and she never went home again. The young missionary soon discovered that the way to reach Indian people was through sacrifice. And she reached out to the poorest, the youngest, and the most despised among them, especially the babies and the children given to the Hindu temples who were forced to serve as slaves and were tortured if they were caught trying to escape. Amy not only felt sorry for the children, but she was spurred, she was motivated into action. She got involved by rescuing them. She built a home and recruited a staff to care for these people. The ministry became, became known as the Donover Fellowship. Amy Carmichael's mission trip ended 55 years later when she died at the age of 83. And during that time, she rescued over 1,000 abused, abandoned, and enslaved children. Her stories, prayers, and her devotions filled 35 books back in the country of Britain. But not once did she return to hear the praises of her friends and supporters. To Amy, anything that called attention to herself stole attention from the God that she served. Her example of humility, service, and sacrificial love has encouraged countless numbers of Christians to follow her, follow her to the mission field 
or to treat others with the same attitude. God's approval was upon her life because she glorified Jesus Christ with her life and did the best that she had even though she was a frail woman. She didn't use that as an excuse. She says, I'm going to put God first in my life and I'm going to do what I feel like He wants me to do. And God did use her. God did bless her. You know, there's something else that God approves. It's found in Proverbs chapter 3, verse number 3 and verse number 4. Here it is. The warmth of mercy and truth are approved by God. Now here's what Proverbs 3, 3 says. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thy heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Ladies, have you ever received a beautiful necklace that you loved very much? Perhaps it was a gift from a special person or for a special occasion. It was so special that you wore it all the time or you wore it frequently. Well, this is the idea here about mercy and truth. Mercy and truth are so important that the Lord tells us to, not let, the, to, to uh, not let them be forsaken or to leave us. Hold on to them. And don't lose mercy. Don't lose truth. We are to bind them around our necks and write them on our hearts. Mercy and truth are to be etched in our hearts and to be a part of our nature so that we don't forget them. We are to be mindful and aware of them just like a rope that is tied around our necks. As a person cherishes a beautiful necklace, we are to cherish and adorn ourselves with mercy and also truth. That is acceptable, and it's approved by God. Like a beautiful necklace that attracts attention. The first thing people should recognize about us are mercy and truth. Now what does Solomon mean by mercy and truth? What is he specifically talking about here? Uh, The word mercy is from the word kesed which not only means mercy, it means loving kindness, goodness, or faithfulness. Truth is from the word ameth, which means truth, faithfulness, sureness, reliability, stability, and continuance. All those meanings are wrapped up in that word. When we are kind, when we are faithful, good, truthful, reliable, stable, or steadfast, we're going to find approval or acceptance from both the Lord and men, especially in this day and in this age where it's very difficult to find people with this kind of character and behavior in their life. Many are characterized today by fickleness instead of faithfulness, selfishness instead of kindness. Many are characterized by harshness instead of love. Instability and indecisiveness instead of reliability and steadiness. Men like Moses, Joshua, Joseph, David, Paul, Enoch, Daniel, and Elijah. They found favor with God and men because mercy and truth were a part of their character. Mercy and truth bring blessing to us. Both of them together provide a balance of strength 
and beauty in our character. The gentleness of mercy and love need the firmness of truth. Yet the strength and firmness of truth needs love and kindness as it's proclaimed to other people. Mercy without truth can lead to ungodly compromises. Truth without mercy can lead to unfeeling legalism. When we pursue both of them equally and simultaneously, we reflect the heart of God and we bring Him great treasure. God wants us to have mercy that's balanced with truth and truth balanced with mercy. Throughout the scripture, we find these two traits hand in hand like two sisters walking on the playground. They teach several lessons. First of all, mercy and truth preserve us from the consequences of stupid, sinful decisions in our life. Psalm 40 verse 11, Withhold not thou thy tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let thy loving kindness and thy truth continually preserve me, he says. Number two, they are a pattern of God's character and nature. Psalm 86, 15. But thou, O Lord, are a God full of compassion. Boy, you ought to thank God for that. And gracious, long-suffering, plenteous in mercy and truth. It's the nature of God. Number three, they purge away iniquity from us or bring about reconciliation. Proverbs 16, 6. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. Number four, they protect those in authority because of the loyalty they produce in people's lives. Proverbs 20, 28. Mercy and truth preserve the king. Number five, they are a product of doing what is good and right. Proverbs 14, 22. Do they not err that devise evil, but mercy and truth shall be, be to them that devise good. Number six, praise erupts from our lips for God's mercy. And I thank God for his mercy and his truth. I'm thankful he puts up with me. By the way, I'm thankful y'all put up with me too. Amen. But I'm thankful he puts up with me. Uh, he, he gives mercy and truth to us, which beckons our praise. You know, Psalm 138.2 says, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. You know, past, Pastor Adrian Rogers shared the story of the despair of the famous author Ernest Hemingway who, who, who did not accept God's grace. He did not accept God's mercy. Hemingway ended up killing himself, even though he was famous, adored, and, pra and praised by people. He went ahead and killed himself anyway. He wrote, life is just a dirty trick, a short journey from nothingness to nothingness. There's no remedy for anything in life. A man's destiny in the universe is like a colony of ants on a burning log. It doesn't make sense. It's a joke. A bad joke. Hemingway killed himself. Now, you think about the man who doesn't know God and he gets all of the things he wants and they're still, they're still a hole in his heart, in his soul. 
He says, these things don't satisfy. I'm getting older. I'm getting sicker. All I can look forward to is a hole in the ground to rot and decay. There's no answer. There's no meaning. Just from nothing to nothing. And that's the sentiment of many people in this world today who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. It's a shame and a tragedy that Hemingway did not know the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior because there is a remedy, there was an answer, there is an answer to the nothingness that takes place. All these things that you can have in the world don't satisfy that emptiness in here. That's the way God made us. He didn't want things to be able to satisfy you. He created you and me so that he was the only one who could satisfy you. You know, it's a shame that Hemingway did not find the satisfaction, joy, and love that come from the Lord Jesus Christ. If your feeling are, if your feelings are just like Hemingway's, don't make the same mistake that he made. Put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ today. He is the Prince of Peace, and He is the source of tranquility for your life.